nothing new. Same day, same problems for the last 3,000 years. Psalm 13. How long, O oh Lord, in the silence? How long will clouds hide your face? How long must I wait in sorrow? And how long will fear take your place? And how long, O oh Lord, without answers? And how long without your embrace? How long must I hear the liars? How long, O oh Lord, in this place? No matter how long I will sing, Cause you have dealt bountifully with me I will sing, I will sing I will trust in your mercy again I will sing, I will sing And my heart will lay hold of salvation As I sing, you will bring me out of this place How long, O Lord, in the silence? How long will clouds hide your face? How long must I wait in sorrow? How long will fear take your place? How long, O Lord, without answers? How long without your embrace? How long must I hear the liars I hear? How long, Lord, in this place? No matter how long I will sing Cause you have dealt bountifully with me I will sing, I will sing I will trust in your mercy again I will sing, I will sing my heart will lay hold of salvation as I sing. You will bring me out of this place. No matter how long I will sing, you have dealt bountifully with me. I will sing, I will sing. I will trust in your mercy again. I will sing, I will sing And my heart will lay hold of salvation As I sing, you will bring me out of this place As I sing, you will bring me out of this place And from Isaiah chapter 64 Unexpectedly, beyond all we could see, you've always set us free, and we know you will. Unexpectedly, out of deep misery, you've brought forth victory, and we know you your love has waited, great hope can wait, your love awaits us, Lord we will wait, your love has waited, great hope can wait, your love awaits us, Lord we will wait. Unexpectedly, beyond all we could see, you've always set us free, we know you will. Unexpectedly, out of deep misery, you've brought forth victory, we know you will. Your love has waited, great hope can wait, your love awaits us, 
Lord, we will wait. Your love has waited. Great hope can wait. Your love awaits us. Lord, we will wait. Your love has waited. Cause great hope can wait. Your love awaits us. Lord, we will wait. Your love has waited. Great hope can wait. Your love awaits us. Lord, we will wait. Heavenly Father, though, we often may feel quite alone. We are together. Lord, even those who have left this physical body, Lord, to be absent from the body is to be present with you. Lord, you promised two or three gathered in your name, but you also said that you would never leave any of us, never forsake us. Lord, may our hearts be renewed in the great hope that we have because of your love. Lord, you know the circumstance of, of each person listening and praying along with us right now. Lord, you know their need. You hear their prayer. You have an answer. Lord, we pray for the, the congregation that meets here in Fresno. We ask, Lord, that you would work a way to make things work out. You work all things together for good. And so, Lord, we look to you to provide for each individual family and business, for all the things that we find a struggle, particularly at this time. Lord, we look to you to provide, perhaps quite unexpectedly. Lord, you're consistent. Jesus, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we're so blessed to be together now. In Jesus' name. <clears throat> is this, I hope the sound is better. I just thought I would act like there was no sound. Um, so, yeah, I got, got a little lapel mic there. Hopefully that helps with uh, hearing things. Uh, as far as seeing, there's no help for there. I've got my COVID haircut and uh, I'll, I'll, I do the best I can, but that's, that's just the way it is. So <laughs> first, first off, as always, uh, thanking God and, and then thanking all of you, your prayers, your support. Uh, there, there's a sense in which we can feel together even when we're not together. So thank you. Uh, messages that have come to me and, um, and things that I just know, because uh, a lot of people that love one another here. So, blessed to be with you again in John's Gospel. Fourth chapter is where we're studying right now. And to remind you, the, the first sign in John's Gospel is also the end goal. We're not left to wonder, where is this going? Where is this heading? What's it, what's it uh, turning toward? The, the, the first sign was the wedding feast of Cana. And it was the celebration of personal love. All love comes from God. He's the source of all love. But, but on a personal level, here is the two becoming one. Here's the, the many becoming community, celebrating that love. The water turns to wine. All of that is the end goal. That's the future for humanity. That's where Jesus is taking us. That's what it's all about. That's the first sign. And then the first scene is where Jesus, later in that second chapter, comes to the one house of worship in all the world. There was one true house of worship. Talk about inconvenient to get there. But when he went there, it was even more inconvenient because of the way they had things set up. And you know the story, but at any rate, the first scene has Jesus coming in there and he's saying, this house of worship has failed. And it's failed because you've turned it into a business. And uh, that's not what it was meant to be. It was supposed to be a place of prayer, 
for everybody, Jews and Gentiles, Samaritans, everybody alike. So your house of worship isn't a house of worship. It's a, it's a failed business because that's what you turned it into. And then he says, there's a new location coming. that will never fail. He said, you destroy this temple, referring to his own body. I'll raise it up again in three days. And that risen temple, that, that place is still as it always has been. And I just point that out to you as we head toward chapter 4 again, because in the light of our current climate, worse than COVID, worse than virus, there are things that are happening that should not happen. And they happen, as always, where heaven itself happens, or hell, within you, in the hearts and in the minds. And, and all sorts of anger and all sorts of frustration because anger tends to come out of frustration and when people are forced and when people are bottled up it all works together and you know it's happening i I don't want to distract you from john's gospel right now i really don't i'm just afraid we're already distracted you know we, we come in here from wherever we've come from and now we want to not be distracted so let's go back to the feast Let's go back not to Cana, because that's not the only place it happens. Let's go back to the marriage feast, because you know what? The bridegroom is with us. That's the exciting story. The bridegroom is with us. The temple is risen, and he's with us. And if any people on the planet should understand what it means to be alone together, it should be those of us who trust in Christ. And so with the bridegroom with us, We can drink deeply of the best wine there is, the wine of his love. So I'd encourage you, wherever you are right now, drink up. Drink of the wine of his love. Drink deeply. It washes away so much frustration and bitterness and other distractions. It's the best kind of drunk, drunk in the spirit. Drinking of the wine of his love. Let's not be distracted. Let's go back to the feast. Remember the last words of John the Baptist there in the last chapter. He said, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which is what I hope to be, a friend of the bridegroom, he stands and hears him and rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And so this joy of mine has been made full. Full joy. Why not? He must increase. I must decrease. Not sad. That's exciting. I must decrease, but my future is forever increasing. Union, communion, feasting, wine, that's the future. That's the exciting thing. Now, here in chapter 4, we see this lone woman, and she's a loved woman, but she doesn't know it. But Jesus makes it clear. He races, he, he works, he wearies himself to make sure that he gets there, to let her know, you are loved. You personally, specifically, you are precious. You are loved. And there in John chapter 4, verse 16, he said to her, go call your husband and come back here. And you know from the story that, man, that must have hurt when he said that. And he knew it would hurt. But he didn't say it to hurt her. He spoke as always to heal, but he had to touch the place where it hurt. Because that's where, like most of us, you hope that that some love would happen there, somewhere in my life. And though we really don't understand at all really what her story is, the summary gives you an idea that, wow, there's got to be a lot of pain. Whatever happened in her life, there's got to be a lot of pain. And so he touches on that in order to heal her. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have said well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. And again, as we looked at last week, he commends her for this. He commends her for an honest answer, even though I doubt that she intended to be honest. I I think she just wanted, like a lot of us, I don't want to deal with the pain. I don't want to deal with, you know, but it would be nice to have this water that you're talking about, this water that I don't have to come back to the well again. And so even though that may have not have been her intention, there's something there. And it's the nature of our God. It's the nature that Jesus presents, not to find fault, but to see something good and to commend her and to say at the beginning and at the end of what he says, this is what you've said well, and this is what you've said 
True. But also, I know about all the other things. I know about all of that. And so, moving on, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And of course, a prophet is not just one who predicts the future. A prophet means someone who can speak forth from God. And a lot of people claim that uh, God said and God told me. And a lot of people like to use the, the ultimate trump card that you throw down there. God said. They, they, oh, my goodness. But this woman's impressed enough with Jesus that she really believes. I believe that what you say will actually be something from God. I perceive that you're a prophet. And so she asked something that I believe she thought truly important. She said, our fathers, remember she's a Samaritan woman, she says, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, Gerizim. You people, that is the Jews, you say that in Jerusalem, that that's the place where men ought to worship. And we talked about it, I don't know, it seems like forever ago, but when we were right there at the beginning of this story, talked about the Samaritans and the history and why the division, and it had already been going on for four, five centuries when Jesus stood with her, and, and it still goes on today. There are still Samaritans living in Palestine, and it's not just the, the, the Jews and the Arabs and the Muslims and the Christians. Uh, the Samaritans also have their bickerings and their quarrels because they're people, and people tend to do that. Political people, religious people. If there's ever one place on the planet that it seems like a, a pointless prayer, a useless prayer, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. How? Now, I know who. It's this one. It's the Prince of Peace. It's, it's Jesus. And she's touching on a, a, an ancient wound, already ancient at that time, saying, which, which place is the place of worship? And she feels like, maybe I'll get an answer. She's not looking for healing, I don't think. She's just wanting to know who's right. Because we all tend to think that we're right. Okay. And then, and then maybe our loyalty goes beyond ourselves. We like to think that our family is right. We like to think that those closest to us are right. I come from the right tribe. I come from the right background. Me and my people, we, it's just human nature. That's what we do. And so she feels like somebody can finally give an answer straight from God. Who's right here? Which is the right place to worship? Because she wants to settle something. But you know, things don't get settled that way. Which is the right place to worship? That's not how you heal wounds. In fact, that's the source of so many wounds because human nature hasn't changed since then. It doesn't change. We, we can improve, we can grow, hopefully individually we're maturing, hopefully as society we're, we're becoming more cultured and ref refined and, and less likely to blow each other up over an argument. But human nature, right down into the DNA, there's certain ways in which we are wired. It's just the way we are. And knowing something about that can, can help us for good mental health, for good heart health, for good societal health. And, and we tend to want to get settled on certain specific things. And places of worship, instead of being places, yes, Individual groups come together at places of worship. But it's not what holds our society together. God holds society together somehow in spite of our places of worship. But even the places become battlegrounds whenever there's a division within the community of people over what happens in the buildings and what happens on the campus. And you have the church splits and you have the first church of and the second church of and the third church of. And it's, it's just human nature again. So to think that, that places of worship and finding which one is the right one is somehow going to settle things, it's, it's going in the wrong direction. Places of worship often become the places of division and quarreling and fighting that can last centuries upon centuries upon centuries. So she's looking to, to hopefully get something settled. But Jesus, <laughs> but God, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. 
You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. I, I read through that, and I ask myself, how can I possibly go any faster through the Gospel of John? When he says something like that, I mean, granted, I could give some simplistic answers real quick, a few of my opinions, and move on to the next few verses, but um, I don't want to do that. And when I ask myself, more importantly, I ask my Heavenly Father, what does this mean? Jesus, what are you saying here? Wow. I don't intend to get through the Gospel of John. I, I've talked about having a few years left before I retire from the the formal teaching, but teaching and learning are two different things. And when I was in school, it was always, I want to get through this. I want to get through this semester, and then I want to get through that semester, and then I got 37 units I have to take, and I want to get through this, and I want to get through that. And that's why I learned so little when I was in college, because I always just wanted to get through it. I would learn enough to pass the test and move on and get the degree, and then the poor people that here I come to be their therapist, you know. But you learn, hopefully, you keep learning, you keep learning, you keep learning. But my goal is not to get through. My goal in life, as it is in this study, my goal is to learn something. And not to learn it, to put it in the banks of my memory, to pull it out a Bible baseball question answer, or to better argue against someone who thinks differently than I do. I want to learn to be a better person, which means more like Jesus. That's the goal of my life, to to learn to be a better person. And, and I expect that I'm going to be learning to the day I die, and then I'm going to be learning to die. And all of that is about what life is. Learning to live and learning to die and learning all the way along and knowing that it doesn't end. I must decrease, he must increase, I'm in him, he's in me. It goes on forever, the learning and the exploring and the growing. But right now, I see what he says there, and I realize how much. I couldn't possibly explain to you because I don't know. And even if uh, I thought I exhausted what there was to say, I'd certainly exhaust you if I tried something like that. Better to just look at it a little bit today, talk about it a little bit today, leave it with you all week. We'll come back to this section again later. Uh, he does, as often, not quite answer her question. He points to where salvation comes from. It comes from these roots along the Jewish line. But of course, we know salvation is a person. He is salvation standing there, and he was a Jew, not a Samaritan. But what he says there in speaking of worship, we already saw the, the first sign, the feast, the water to wine. We saw all of that, and then the first scene, the one house of worship, a true house of worship, that was truly failed, turned into a business, an essential business. It's not essential at all. I got something brand new for you, a risen me. And he's with us always, not just when two or three gather together. We, we know that that promise is given there, specifically in the context of trying to deal with somebody who's hurting and trying to to talk to them. The Lord's there to help you, not to kick them out of the church, but to win your brother back. That's the specific context of the two or three, but it's not a magic number because it's not magic. Two or three is where we begin to fight <laughs> or begin to love. It's where we begin to have maybe different ideas and thoughts, but to become of one heart and mind in Christ, that's always the goal. But two or three isn't the magic number. He promised, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's here. And the house of worship is the one in which you live and move. Here in our hearts, we worship. In spirit, in truth, that's what the Father is seeking for. And how important it is that we learn that. I wonder, first off, when I read through all those red letters, 21 through 24, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem, that mountain, shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. 
didn't say that they don't worship. They just don't know what they're worshiping. We worship that which we do know. Salvation is from the Jews. That's Jesus. An hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father is seeking to be his worshipers. You see, the Father is, in fact, recruiting for worshipers. I think he's doing it in a very different way than we would think. God is spirit, and those who worship him, if, if we truly worship him, those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. I read all of that again. I just read it with you. And I say, how much do we really believe that answer? How much do we really believe what he said? And, and a better question, at least for me, is how much do we want to believe what he said? Because I'm convinced that people believe what they want to believe. And at the core, the place where Jesus touches to heal, the places where we've been hurt, that's, that's where, those are the deep things that he desires to deal with. And worship, he said, must be in spirit and in truth. And boy, that's a lot. <laughs> what does that mean, spirit and truth? Well, well clearly, you know this, you know what spirit is not. Spirit is not material, not physical. So worship is not about physical location or physical thing, things. All the things of matter don't really matter when it comes to worship. Do we believe that? Jesus said, God is spirit. We also know God is love. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Again, the goal being the marriage feast. The goal being union and communion, wedding, wine. You jump ahead, we've done it before. I'll read the last prayer, or at least the one in John 17. My prayer is not for them alone, Father. I pray for all those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. And then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. That's John 17. If, if we ever get that far, do you think I'm going to cover that one in a week? But the rest of my life, I hope I can be learning because that's where we're heading and that's where he's taking us to. That unity, think about it a little bit. Sometimes maybe my own voice is distracting to you. But you got all week and you got a lifetime to, to think about that kind of unity. It might be frightening. And of course, unity doesn't mean uniformity. It doesn't mean that we all become lost. We, we actually become found, our uniqueness, our individualness. The, the woman that Jesus would weary himself to, to talk to her. We'll always have that. But there's a unity that we're headed toward. What forces can possibly be brought to bear upon living matter or non-living matter, upon physical structures that could bring about that kind of unity? We have a, a concept of, of creation through a, a big bang, <laughs> hard, to, hard to even begin to understand that sort of concept. But it's a reality. The, the things of, of, of physics, the things of the universe are realities. The, the holy grail of clean energy, the one that they're always working on, but wow, if they ever get it together, is, is not fission, not the nuclear reactor where the atom is split, but where, where atoms are actually fused together. And, and where they have these uh, you know, billions and billions of dollars uh, being invested into all of these research projects all over the world, these uh, tokamak uh, reactors where, where they're actually putting magnetic pressure on stuff that's heated up like the heat of the sun. Put the, and it, it's squirmy. If you've ever tried to squish plasma together, you know. <laughs> Again, I, I like to read about this stuff that I don't understand 
Because I, I do understand this, that, it, that if you get that figured out, no one has to worry about the price of gas at the gas pump anymore. It's, it's the holy grail of energy, but what kind of, of incredible pressure do you have to put upon that plasma to bring fusion? to bring unity. Now we're, we're talking about the things that don't matter. We're talking about matter. But all of it is a picture. And Jesus is talking in the spirit something so, talk about a holy grail, union, communion, oneness, wine, wonderful, forever. A picture like that. What kind of pressure do you have to put to bear? And I say all of this to simply say it doesn't work that way. And I say that simply because that's the way we work. Everything's about pressure and fear and pushing and pushing and pushing. And where there's a push, there's always a pushback. I think Newton said something about that. And where you shove me, I shove you. And I'll show you because I shoved you. And all of this way, it's, it's the way it works in this world. It's not the way God works. It's not the way Jesus worked. He starts with what's inside because if what's inside isn't real, nothing's real. If I have not love, you go down the list, it's nothing. So it's not about anything pushing from the outside to fuse it together. It's about someone working from the inside. And, and the very one that's working in each of you as you hear this, because you know it's true. You know that somehow he loves me. And if he loves me, I need to learn how to love others. And, and that's the essence of what it all comes down to. And that's what worship is all about. Getting to that place that he prays for in John 17, it's a spiritual journey. We worship in the spirit. She said, in this mountain or in that mountain, in this building or in that building. He says it has to be in the spirit. There's, there's no other Bible bus. There's no other vehicle you can get in that's going to take you there. It's got to be in the spirit. To Nicodemus, who had all the qualifications of birth and education and desire, coming to Jesus by night, he said, you have to begin again. You have to be born in the Spirit. Same sort of thing being told to this woman. An equal playing field. It's not a game, but a way in which beginning again, beginning with Jesus, we can have hope. I do have hope because of Jesus. Now, I think this woman was having a really hard time understanding what Jesus was saying. I know I am. I think Nicodemus was having a really hard time understanding what Jesus said. Because he kept going back to, as smart as he was, you know, how, how can that happen? How, how can such a thing be? But I don't let that discourage me, my lack of understanding. Because love is patient and love is kind. And Jesus doesn't put pressure on anybody. But he invites and he, and he promises. And our tendency when it comes to trying to understand things, it's not just our tendency, it's the only way our brains can work. When a word is spoken, we, we paint a picture. If I say dog, some of, each of you have a picture of something, or maybe a couple dogs. Uh, okay, that's the conventions of language. Whenever a word is used, a picture of some sort is being painted, and we may each have a different picture, and depending on our culture and background, hold different ideas. But that's the weakness of words. They're important, but ultimately, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's why we could never overdo going through the Gospels and looking specifically at everything that Jesus said and did, because all of it is hard to understand, but it paints the true picture. I simply point out the fact that when we're trying to understand something like these words we're looking at right now, our tendency, we can't help it. Our tendency is to paint a picture in our mind based on our culture and experience, and we think we know what he's saying, especially when we use words like worship. What does that mean? You know, right now there's, there's a church across the street worshiping. They're doing it in the parking lot. They probably never would have thought of doing it in the parking lot if it weren't for the circumstances that we're in. In fact, no one probably would have painted the picture in their mind. Oh yeah, that's worship. But right now they're doing it out there and they're honking their horns and great. Depending on where their heart is at, spirit and truth, they are or they are not worshiping God, but it's not the picture you would have painted before a couple of weeks ago. And, and 
you know, we'll get back together again here on this campus, probably, I guess, sometime in June, one of these Sundays, pretty soon. But when we get back together, it won't be anything like we thought it would be ever again. And, and for a while, you know, because I'm not a health expert, even though I'm a health professional, um, I'm going to rely on health professionals to give us guidelines for locally what we'll do. And I'll bet you when we get back together, we'll have to guess who we are because we'll all have masks on. And, and we will probably meet outside in the courtyard because it's proven to be better off sunlight and, and certainly air circulation better out there. And uh, social distancing, all the stuff that, you, you know, we've gotten a crash course on it the last few months. But you guys, you guys all know what, I mean, we never would have pictured that as worship, but that's, that's, when we get here this next time, it'll be something like that. Bring your own lawn chair with you, then we don't have to wipe anything down, just take your germs with you when you leave. Or something. something like that. But we'll, not only will we get through it, we'll, we'll have fun. We can have fun because it's just one more season of life. One thing that families go through things, and, and, and it's just different ways in which we worship, but things we never pictured in the past. But typically when we think of worship and what Jesus is saying to her, we, we have these ideas, even apart from the stuff I'm talking about right now, and, and they typically are, gonna, typically are gonna involve things that we, we can't really safely do right now, holding hands, hugging, kiss, holy kiss, sharing communion, uh, singing close together, the things that many of us love, to us that is worship. But those are the things that just happen to spread germs. It's, it's, it's nonsense to compare a church to a liquor store in regard to, unless you talk about proximity of people, how many are in there, how long they're in there. Quite frankly, as much as we love, I love to get together. I used to love it at Calvary Costa Mesa where you'd have packed, you, you just packed people as tight as you could get. Bad breath and all. I loved it. I loved the sound of the singing and, and to do that for an hour, two hours. But in terms of virus, in terms of communicable disease airborne, it'll pass. The, the, things will get better. But, you know, we just happened to live through. We, we didn't get to be around for the Kansas flu or the Spanish flu or whatever you want to call it, flu of 1918. This is one that we're going through. So fine, we'll, we'll go through it, but, but let's not be distracted by it because the feast goes on and you drink the wine of his love. And I just encourage you as we're listening to Jesus right now, I know I may be distracting you with things I'm saying, but as you look at what Jesus said to her and as you try to understand it, try to get all the pictures out of your mind of what worship means. Because you cannot help it. Those pictures are based on your culture, your experience, and it may be things you like and would like to do again. That's fine, nothing wrong with that. But just understand, it may not at all be the picture. Certainly the Samaritan woman had a wholly different picture. I think if any of us would visit a church congregation from the first or second century in another part of the world, we'd think, wow, that's, huh? That's really different. That's worship. We have ideas that we have the Psalms and we think we know something about the, the, the way they work. I put them to contemporary music, but who knows the instruments they had back then and the way that they did it and who was involved. I would just encourage you always, because this is the way Jesus works, be open to the fact that what he talks about is more wonderful than what you think about it. Just be open to something broader, something bigger, something that, that might seem almost scandalous and wrong at first, like talking to a Samaritan woman, like people getting together when they have the Samaritan cooties. They, bad company corrupts good morals. We don't want to be with those bad company people. We don't want to be with Samaritans. These things that go on and on and on, just be open. I would encourage myself, be open. Jesus said to her specifically there in verse 21, woman, Believe me. And I'll tell you, if Jesus were trying to sell me on this, I'm sold. In fact, I don't even care if he says woman, believe me. I, I, you know, wait a minute, I'm a guy, I don't care. You're Jesus. And when Jesus says, believe me, I'm sold. That, that's the essence of my faith. I have so many doubts. I have so many things 
that I think are uncertain, unproved, unprovable. I think my faith is a reasonable faith, but the ultimate reason is a person. It's Jesus. I want to believe in Jesus. I find him to be the most beautiful, wonderful person imaginable, almost too good to be true, but I believe that he's true. And if it's Jesus says, believe me, I'm all in. Okay, I'll, I'll believe you. He says, woman, believe me. An hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. Later on in verse 23, an hour is coming, and now it is. You know, he, he hasn't had the hour of his time on the cross or his resurrection, but even just his presence, the hour now is. He says, woman, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in the mountain of Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. Neither one. Which one's right? Something's changing. We love locations. Nothing wrong with that. I've been back to visit the house that, that I was brought up in as a little bitty kid, first house I remember. I go back and I see it. It's not the same. It's, it's like I have to even try to imagine how's this house the same house. But, but there's something about the familiarity. And when it comes to worshiping God, we tend toward fixed locations. We like them. And better than a building, a mountain is very, very thick. This mountain or that mountain. Something solid, something you can see from a long distance. There it is. There's Mount Whitney. There's that mountain. It's immovable. It's fixed. For something as important as my relationship with God, I want something solid, immovable, seen from a long distance. Which mountain is it? And Jesus said, it's not that way anymore. Now, that's the way it was in our kindergarten days. In the Old Testament times, it was literally a, a mountain. And, and when you go back to the ABCs of how things work, that's the way the, the Lord taught us. It's the only way we could learn is those basic things. But Jesus is saying, it's not that way anymore. Now it's not this place or that place, this mountain or that mountain. Now it's in spirit and truth. Now, how does that help me? How do you define spirit and truth? How many churches? We worship in the spirit. What do you mean by that? How can I tell them they're wrong? Because that's my primary goal in life, is to tell them they're wrong. How do you define in spirit and in truth? I, I think because Jesus chose the words, we ought to just let Jesus define the words in our own life. But it leaves a lot of room to explore, to expand, to find out there's more there than just the simplistic little there. I knew that. I understood that. Everything is being taken away in my life. What I knew and understood. No, it's not all being taken away. There's always something better. And what you knew and understood was, in fact, if you understood it, it was too simple. It's something built upon that, but bigger and better. And it's not this place or that place, this building or that building, this mountain or that mountain. It's not going to be that way. It's something even better. Even though you can't define it, even though it may be frustrating, even though you may feel like I do sometimes, God, wouldn't it just be simpler to just have... You know, why, why can't we have a rule book? Why can't we have something, you know, like the Constitution of the United States where everyone knows exactly what it says? Yeah right. Ask the writer. It was designed for growth because a little 13 colony thing and what is now, those people had enough perspective to realize things are going to change and so let's, let's get something. How much more so the Bible? How much more so? Yes, it'd be a whole lot simpler to be able to have fixed words that we know what that word means. Words mean things and you're wrong and I'm right and all the things, and this is the place, and that's the mountain, and Samaritans got off way back when, and I'll show you the place in the Bible where they did. All, it'd be a lot simpler, but not better. And God is into better. Because we're not going to stay in kindergarten forever. Growing up, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child, I reasoned as a child. When I grew up, I started learning to love. That's the language. That's what it's about. So she's trying to settle things by going back. This one or that one? That's a lesson too. 
I amaze myself, even if I amaze no one else. I amaze myself because every time I think I'm going to have a short message and then I look up at the clock and I go. <laughs> Understand that even though this is a long time ago, this is still the way we are. Like this woman and like the Jews who would want nothing to do with her and her own friends who would want, well, not, not friends. <laughs> Human nature hasn't changed. We want to settle disputes by going back. Let's get this thing settled. Let's go back to the roots. Let's go back to the fundamentals. Let's go back to the basics. Let's get some sort of a settlement here. Let's pay some reparations. Let's pay some settlements. Let's get this thing settled. Let's go back. Now, now I finally found a prophet, someone who can really tell me the truth. Which roots are the right roots? Which, which one has the best basis? Where are the purest origins? Whenever you do that, you stay divided. You, you look backward and you have all this division. It started somewhere. Someone was right, someone was wrong. Maybe both were wrong, I don't know. Eventually, you go back far enough, you'll get back to God again. You'll get back to the beginning where God created a, 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 a marriage and a family that got fractured right off the bat, blaming each other and killing and fighting. But at any rate, you go back far enough, you'll get to God again. But we never go back that far. We just go back to 1865 or 1743 or someplace, depending on where you live and who's right. But all you do is, even if you find some real prophet to tell you who was right, you haven't come to any closer union. Vindication. It's not victory, according to God's plan. I was right. Oh, gosh. Heaven help us from all the right people. It's not by going back. It's by going forward. Because you know what? If you ever noticed, I, I see it in the mirror all the time, there's, there's no other way you can go. And you've got to deal with it. You keep going forward. And the question you ask in dealing with other people is, how can we come together? Where can we grow together? Where can we find a commonality? We'll always find it in Christ. We will always find it. Nicodemus and this Samaritan woman find someone who loves them equally. And in Christ, we find a commonality. And it's never by, you can't go back. It's like the, the dial on the washing machine. You ever, you ever used one of those things? You, I, you ever used one of those? You know, you go past the setting you want. You can't go back. You've got to go all the way around again to get to where you want. That's life. Really, it is. You can't go back. But it goes on. And we have to move on. And Jesus points her forward. And he says, believe me. Which is, trust me. Let's go forward. He says, woman, believe me, an hour is coming. Now is when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. And he didn't underline it, but boy, I underlined it in my heart and there on the page. Worship the Father, because she wasn't even talking about who's being worshipped. She was saying, where is the worshipping happening? This place or that place? And what she didn't know, what we all need to know, is who are we worshipping? We're not worshipping God or Allah or whatever name you have to refer to God. We're worshipping the Father. That may seem blasphemy to some folks. Too, too close, too presumptive. How can you call God the creator father? That's what Jesus came to teach us. He loves us. We can call him father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. No man comes to the father but by me. It's because all of the different places and ways and routines of worship often just leave us fighting and squabbling and unsettled. Jesus came as the son of humanity, the son of man, to, to show us that God so loved the world and to, and to bring about a, a unity that is always somewhere in the future. But in practical terms, it's always in talking with, in dealing with people, not let's go back and see who's right, but let's move forward and see how we can grow together, come together. Because all those roots that are divided, wherever they're divided, they come together in the, in the trunk, don't they? And then eventually branch out again, but not branch out in, in, in terribleness. They branch out in fruitfulness. But it's that, it's that picture of life. And so he says, worshiping the Father, as he'd said first of all to her, if you knew the gift of God 
And the one who says to you, give me a drink, then you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. You just needed to know who God is and, and what the gift of God is that's offered. So all of that, all of that to think about between now and next week. And he says, worshiping in spirit and in truth. But let me just leave you with more questions. That's, that's much better than me trying to give you the answers. It really is. What does is, what is worship mean? What does worship mean? I know to you, it may mean any number of things. I, how often we hear, I love to worship. I just love to worship. What are you talking about? Uh, I love to get together with a group of people, and we're all in the same room, singing, loud or soft, with certain instruments and certain styles, and all of that is fine. But please understand, just to get that picture out of your head, that's all personal preference. It's all something I like to do. Do it. Great. Do it. And, and if we took all the things that Jesus didn't say, we'd go on forever. All of the assumptions that he didn't say worship is. So there's no sense in going all the different things we could assume. He just simply said two things. It's to be in the Spirit and it's to be in truth. But as far as if it helps you, as far as the word itself, the Greek word to worship, it's to kiss, to kiss toward and in the earliest days, it was to kiss the ground because you, you know, any great sovereign, any great potentate, potentate wants you to grovel in front of them, right? And that's what I want when my kids come to me. Get down, kiss the ground. Because No, a, a, the fa a father doesn't want that. You know, people who are into power, yeah. But that's not who our God is. So no, it's not fall. And sometimes the word fall down and worship are placed together. But to worship is just to just literally to kiss, to kiss toward. And the style in which that kissing happens can be a whole lot of different ways. But ultimately, understand it's the father, the one who would run to greet the prodigal and keep kissing his neck and kissing and kissing and kissing. The father did all of that because that's the father. It's about a family. I know as far as kissing my kids when they were little, even though they were boys, we kissed them. Then they became men. Should I kiss them? I don't know. Yeah, I'll kiss them. I remember my dad, you know, when, when uh, there was a, probably 10, 20 years, I didn't kiss him. And then, and then I, he's kissed me and I kissed him. We just, every time I saw him until he died. And boy, I'm going to get all emotional again. And I didn't care if he'd had a stroke and there's drool on his cheek. I didn't care. Wipe it off, just like I do my own drool. <laughs> it's my dad. And, and, um, and grandkids kissing. And right now with the COVID thing, we, we went weeks and weeks, months, not, not kissing grandkids. Not because we don't love them, because we do love them and they love us and, and, and there is the possibility. And so we've just refrained from, and we show other ways to kiss toward. We do the, the kombacha or the, the uh, guluka. I love you. Dif different signs and ways and, and blow kisses and, and different ways remotely if it has to be your kids live far off. But those are all kisses toward loved ones. All of that is a sense in which we worship our God. That's what it boils down to. In the spirit and in truth, we express love. I guess that's the most basic concept. Expressing love toward the Father. That's worship. Now, how many ways can you express love toward the Father? That's your homework. Not, not, oh, not homework. Think about it. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. How many ways can you express love toward your Heavenly Father? That's worship. No one can take away your right to worship. Ever. That's your decision. Once you know how much He loves you, I think you'll decide, as I have, that even if in this crazy, messed up world I find myself in who knows what kind of terrible circumstances, because it happens in this world, I'm going to worship him. Because he's my sanity. He's my life. He loves me. He understands things that make no sense to me at all. And the only way I can settle it there is not by looking at anything in the past. I get settled in this because of those one two words that Jesus said to me. Believe me. I believe him. Let's turn to him with a closing song.
Heavenly Father, I find that it's good to give up, good to let go, good to be still and know that you are God. And I also find, Lord, that it's hard to do, very hard sometimes for me. But when I see who it is who says, let it go, trust me, give it up, lay it down, I'm ready. Help me, Lord. I must decrease. It's a good thing. You must increase. That is wonderful. I surrender. Lifting empty hands to you. This is all you've asked for. Help my heart to bring you full surrender. To your gentle hands I fall And here I hit the bottom Here I rise again In you, Jesus In you, Jesus Loving you Filling me In you, Jesus I'm in you, Jesus, loving you, filling me. I surrender, lifting empty hands to you. This is all you've asked for, so help my heart to bring you full surrender. Into your nail-pierced hands I fall And here I find my purpose And here I find my hope In you, Jesus In you, Jesus Loving you Filling me In you, Jesus, loving you, filling me. In you, Jesus, in you, Jesus, trusting you, trusting you, guiding us, guiding us. In you, Jesus. We're in you, Jesus, trusting you, helping us, helping us. I surrender. And Lord, you will help us to move forward. Lord, you will settle all things in yourself. Lord, how exciting it feels. To follow you. In Jesus' name.